Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Glad that everybody's here. I've got uh, one announcement, one introduction, and then you'll be done having to listen to me uh, today. Um, my one announcement that I have is around the church, we have things that always need to be done and fixed and put together. How many of y'all uh, understand that the lights don't turn themselves on in the morning, the air conditioner doesn't turn itself on, heater, all those things? People have to do those things. Well, in the same exact way, the reason that our weeds are dying is because someone sprays weed killer on them. All these things like that. Um, we've got a lot of different things that we've got coming up at the church that we need to kind of get a handle on. One of those things, the main one, is our student room, which is over on the other side. And we're going to blow some walls out, which is going to be fun. Everybody say demo day. Yeah. Everybody loves demo day. Uh, here's the thing. I have no tools, so I need people to uh, bring some tools up here. Um, so I can't do this. I need your help. Uh, next Saturday, we're going to be having a, a work day here at the church. Um, it's Y'all say, well, that's pretty quick notice. If I give you all a bunch of notice, you'll find reasons that you can't come. So with short notice, it gives you less time to think about that. So next Saturday, men and women, students, uh, we're going to meet up here at 8 o'clock from 8 to 12. We're just going to do some work around here. we got stuff in here that needs to be done. Um, like I said, we're going to blow a wall out next week. Pretty sure it's load-bearing. We'll figure that out when we bust the wall out. Uh, it's going to be fun. Um, so if you've got some tools, uh, pop off. Come on with it. And, yeah, we need your help. Um, so can you just raise your hand and say, I'll be here? I'll be here. Don't lie in the house of the Lord. Okay, cool. So um, today we are incredibly privileged uh, to have um, one of our very own. Uh, she is probably, you know, I heard one time, um, uh, I think it was Tim Ross that said at a, at a preaching conference that we were at and they, and he said, you know, um, I, I don't, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room when you preach. I'm not saying that Ashley's not, um, I'm saying this towards me. Uh, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room when you preach. You just need to be the most knowledgeable on that, on that topic when you preach for that day, um, on that context. And I knew that we were coming up to Exodus and Ashley is probably the, um, she, she is amazing when it comes to the book of Exodus. She knows so incredibly much about it. She brings it to life. And so we're working through our, our go series of like what that means for, for God to call for us to go. And so, uh, I approached Ashley, I actually gave her several weeks to bail out. And I think that she wanted to, um, but it, the way that God works is that God uh, gave her a new job where she was going to be able to say, well, I have to work that weekend. But sh so she actually ended up getting a different job and it allowed for her to be off. She had several different things she was going to say that she couldn't come, but God kicked them all out of the way. And so now she is just sweating bullets. She drank a lot of coffee this morning. She has got a roll of toilet paper uh, with her. I'm not sure what that means, but I'm sure it's going to be good. So everybody, y'all stand up and let's show her that we're excited to hear the words today from Ashley Nichols. Come on up here, Ashley. So if I can, I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to hand this mic over to you, and you're going to do your thing. Okay, so Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. And God, I'm just incredibly grateful um, that you've given us the word and you've given us the Holy Spirit to be able to interpret what you uh, have for us today. Father, my, my, my prayer is that you will change the hearts of the people that are in this room. Father, I pray that you'll speak to us like we've never been spoken to before. And, and God, I pray that it won't be a mystery what you want for us to do. Father, I pray for some people that means that they uh, move uh, in a relationship with you today through your Holy Spirit speaking words. And for others, I pray that it moves us closer uh, to you. Maybe we... Uh, give a few things up in our life, or Father, we surrender parts of our life to you. God, I don't know what that looks like, but Father, I pray that there's a closer walk with you and when we're done. So Father, I pray the Holy Spirit would speak uh, through Ashley in a way that, that only the Holy Spirit can do and in a way that only Ashley can speak. And, and Father, just give her boldness this morning. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so... I guess I should start because I feel obligated to explain. This is either for crying or nervous poopy, so thank you for pointing that out to us. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay, I'm Ashley. If you don't recognize me, that's probably because I'm wearing makeup and a dress, and usually I sit way in the back. That's where I'm most comfortable. So this is not my spot. Bright lights are not my spot. So, But here I am. I'm married to Jack. Everybody knows Jack. He's a saint. Yes. Yes. He's a saint and I'm his wife, so there we go. <laughs> um, so like Josh said, 
several weeks back, he, um, we caught each other in passing, just very casually caught each other. I was leaving. I was actually going to pick up Messy May and try and drag her out of church because they can either be a hood rat or a ch church mouse, and we're praying that May will be a church mouse. And so I went to go get her, and um, Josh caught me in passing, and he said, Hey, I have something for you. Now, I don't know if anybody's taking notes, but for those of you who are taking notes, if I were to rank my love languages, receiving gifts ranks right above hugs and lady doctor visits for me. I am not a receiving of gifters. That is not my thing. Um, but intrigued by Josh's request and um, fully, like fully or freshly full of the spirit, I hung around and I obliged and I said, okay, I'll hang around and see what he's got for me. Um, I'm pretty sure I have some undiagnosed ADD, so my brain went about a million places with that. Um, so I'll spare you the details of the inner workings of my brain, but basically what I had concluded was that Josh was going to give me a book. He was going to whittle me a wooden spoon <laughs> or he was going to beat up Jack. <laughs> so like I said, I can't, I can't get into that because then that's a whole nother sermon in and of itself. Um, so imagine my surprise when Josh approached me and his hands were empty and his clench, his fists weren't clenched up, ready to be up Jack. And he said, and I'm going to paraphrase, but he said for me, Hey, I have something for you. You're supposed to bring a word on Exodus as it pertains to our Go series. So I'd like to point out, first of all, Josh is a mastermind, okay? Because this bait and switch of, hey, I've got a gift for you. Just kidding, it's a chore. I really would like to try that on my children and see if that's successful. So, um, And then second of all, I thought, wait, what? That's not what I was expecting at all. Like I said, I was expecting a spoon or a whoopin, one of those, but not to bring a word. And in that very moment, when I was thinking that's not what I was expecting, I felt the Holy Spirit say, well, Ashley, what were you expecting? And what does that have to do with going and me telling you to go? The Spirit's super sarcastic with me. That is a love language that I understand is sarcasm. That, physical violence, those are my love languages. <laughs> So what were you expecting and what does that have to do with going? You see, my willingness and our willingness to go forward and live out God's given purpose when we're told comes with about a bajillion questions. God says go and we say what? Me? Go? Where? Why? How? We begin our own cost-benefit analysis of the direction we've been given. If you're like me, you assess the physical and the proverbial return on investment. You say, okay, what's the return on investment of my time spent, of my money spent, of my effort spent? And we come to the point where we end up with a watered down version of what God told us to go do. Because Jesus really didn't mean and must not have meant this is what I wanted you to go do. <clears throat> so don't get me confused. I know some of you are very eager to pull triggers. I am not. But don't get me confused. Discernment is good. It's good for us. It's righteous even. But sometimes we can discern ourselves right out of obedience to God's will simply because when he says go, that's not what I was expecting. So Josh has been working through this series of go. Last year he gave us the word freedom. And then Toby felt led. They're going to stop feeling led pretty soon, I'm sure. Um, felt led to ask me to teach Exodus, and we have been in Exodus for a year <laughs> uh, in Sunday school. But this year, the word, that was from our freedom word of last year, but this year, the word that um, has been prayed over and given to the churches, go. So Josh has been working us through the go series. He's been working us from Genesis through everybody's step, our character step um, of obedience when God told them to go. And my understanding of it is that as we start to step into obedience and saying, okay, God, I'm going to go. I'm going to go like Abraham. I'm going to do this like Joseph. I'm going to abandon my past 
and I'm going to move forward and I'm going to go. My understanding is that as we start to evolve into each character, we recognize how those characters are going to lead us all the way to Jesus. Those obedient acts of faith and steps of faith when God says, go, bring us to Jesus. And then outside of and past this side of the resurrection, they lead us to our story because their story is our story because God is still the God who is saying, go move forward to us. So Josh has worked through this and part of what he's talked about uh, in this series so far is how we need to abandon our past. How our past can hinder us and can haunt us and he's given us some real life steps and how we can move forward but not hold on to the baggage that comes with that moving forward. But when God spoke to me, he told me that Ashley, not only are we needing to abandon our past, we need to surrender our expectations because our expectations can keep us from going too. So if you guys will turn to Exodus 13, 17, and I'll catch you up really quickly and I'll try not to take 40 years. <laughs> um, so we meet in Exodus. Um, Joseph had brought the people. He saved his people, the Israelites, um, brought them from famine, brought them to Egypt. There they were given the most favored land. Um, and in that time, Joseph dies. All that generation dies. And they don't have the favor they once have. The Israelite people have been brutally enslaved for 400 years. They've cried out to God for deliverance from the thing that they thought was a good thing that had turned sour. There's a glimpse, a small glimpse of hope. We're fed information on a small glimpse of hope when Moses is born. Moses is saved from the Pharaoh that's killing all the firstborn sons. He's raised as an Egyptian. He tries to deliver the Israelites on his own accord. Um, he fails miserably to do that. And then he decides to run. He runs the exiles to Midian after that failed deliverance attempt. There in Midian, he becomes a shepherd. He gets a wife. He becomes a shepherd to his father-in-law, Jethro. Um, and while he's out and about, he comes across a burning bush. And at that burning bush, God tells him to go back to Egypt and to actually deliver the people that he had failed to deliver previously. When he comes back to Egypt, he confronts the Pharaoh um, he confronts the Egyptian gods because every single, I don't know, just a little trivial knowledge, every single plague that is in Exodus is actually a direct toe-to-toe -to -toe confrontation with God and false gods. All of those gods were represented by one of the Egyptian false gods. So it wasn't just a random plague of blood to wa or water to blood. It wasn't a random plague of frogs. Um, every single one of them is representing a false god of the Egyptians. Super nerdy. I won't get into it, but I love it. Um, but yeah, just so you know that. Um, so there, uh, God confronts uh, the, the Pharaoh, the Egyptian gods, with the plagues and trials. And ultimately, in the 10th plague, you guys probably know this, in the 10th plague, he avenges the firstborn of God, which is Israel. He takes the firstborn of the Egyptians. Um, and finally, then, only then, does Pharaoh humble himself to God's call to let my people go. Once they are leaving, God tells Israel, and had told them before, to plunder the Egyptian people. So Israel takes all of the Egyptians for their gold, their fine linens, their silver, their jewelry. The Egyptians show favor to the Israelites, just as God had prophesied years prior. And then the Israelites hurriedly leave. They leave quickly. And they leave with everything they've had and have, and then some, because they're leaving with Egyptian stuff. Uh, they're leaving with livestock, their food, their clothing, their family, their jewelry. They're leaving battle ready with the bones of Joseph carried on their back. They're leaving with everything. And they're freed from Egypt to uh, head for the land overflowing with milk and honey. And that's what we call the promised land. So they're headed to the promised land, but they're headed to the promised land by way of the desert. They're following a pillar of cloud and fire. Literally, that's all they can see. They can't see through it and past it. They're headed the opposite direction of the promised land. Um, not the most common sense route. They drive, I guess, I guess they're going the route my husband would choose because he always chooses the scenic route. It's the worst. Um, 
And then if you read further beyond that point, you'll find that Israel did not expect to be headed to uh, the desert either. So we're in Exodus 13, 17 through 18. I guess I'll read it. This is a different platform from Sunday school, y'all. I can let y'all talk during Sunday school. Now I have to sound like I know what I'm talking about, and it's, it's great. Um, okay. So Exodus 13, 17 through 18. So they're following these pillars of cloud, and it says, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. So you see, they have spent the last year. Well, let's back up even further. They've spent the last 400 years crying out to God for deliverance. They've been praying for deliverance. And then Moses comes along. Moses is 80 years old at this point. Moses comes along and says, hey, I have deliverance for you. And over the next year, they get to witness and not be subjected to the plagues. They watch God go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Egyptians and Pharaoh. So they watch. Not only are they delivered, they watch that their deliverance came in a spectacular and miraculous miraculous sort of way but that didn't matter that didn't matter at all it didn't matter that they had successfully plundered the egyptians which by the way like a year or two years late earlier god had said when you leave you will plunder the egyptians which by the way in genesis also joseph knew that when they left they would plunder the egyptians none of that mattered actually it wasn't joseph it was his dad jacob so he had told him in Genesis that this was going to happen. That didn't matter. Um, it didn't matter that they were leaving Egypt free from bondage, equipped for battle, and having everything they could possibly need. None of that mattered. No amount of miraculous, miraculous signs or timing changed the fact that God knew that the Israelites would change their minds and turn back to bondage solely based and solely determined by what they saw with their eyes. They expected freedom. They expected bountiful land. And any suggestion of otherwise in their sight would instantaneously unravel that they had just been delivered in such a wonderful way. This isn't an ancient phenomenon either. If our expectations are not fulfilled, we too will turn back to bondage for the sake of comfort. One moment out of step with what we anticipate is blurring God's faithfulness and deliverance and diminishes his fresh deliverance of you too. God had just made good on a four century year old promise, 400 years, but Israel would willingly turn back to bondage based on what they saw with their eyes. And even when they couldn't see, the grumbling and no suggestion of war would start only three days into the wilderness and on the other side of their freedom and on the other side of walking through the Red Sea. Because just like us, when reality doesn't align with our expectations, we're quick to talk ourselves out of God's call to go to us. Did God really tell me to go? Did he really want me in this place? Did God bring me to this place just to ruin me? See, when we move into the desert and we expect the land overflowing with milk and honey, um, our hearts can only be prone to turning back and grumbling against God also. This is not what I signed up for, God. This is not what you promised me, God. It looks like the good old bait and switch tactic was alive and well several hundreds of years ago, <laughs> thousands of years ago also, Josh, at least you're in good company. So if our expectations, like in this verse, Exodus 13, 17 through 18, if our expectations are exposed by the eye, then in order to move forward, we've got to learn how to surrender our expectations to God. And if they're exposed by the eye, then surrendering expectations means at least two things for us today. First, surrendering expectations means that we go despite what we see. So um, this is, this is I'm going to paraphrase here, okay? But Moses is at the burning bush, 
and I'm going to paraphrase it because it's really long. And like I said, I don't want to keep you here for 40 years. So Moses is sitting at the burning bush. He didn't expect. He just happens to glance. He's caught his eye that there's this bush that's being consumed. This is Exodus 3 if you kind of want to fact check me, any fact checkers. Um, so he's sitting there. He notices the burning bush, and he's like, well, let me go see it. He goes over to the burning bush, and God calls out and says, don't come any further. Take off your shoes. Take off your shoes, and then approach me for the ground you step on is holy ground. I have theories about that <laughs> that are too long, but take off your shoes. To me, it says, Ashley, take off your shoes because I know you ain't going to run when I start talking barefoot knowing there's thorns out here. So anyway, he approaches this burning bush, and God tells him, God tells him, he says, hey, Moses, I want you, I want you to go back. This is your God-given purpose, and I want you to deliver my people. And Moses, I want you to think about where Moses is at, what he sees around him, what his circumstances are. Moses had failed previously. When Moses was 40 years old, he tried to save two people. And in Acts, um, in Acts Stephen, when he's given his speech, it's Acts uh, chapter 7, verse 23, he says, Stephen says that Moses tried to deliver them and he supposed that they knew that this was God's hand trying to deliver these people. And so Moses knew his call. He supposed that these people would know that he was meant to deliver them, but he failed because he kept doing it his way. So 40 years later, he runs and now he is comfortable. He's in a position where he likes his job. It's really nice. It's really easy. I get to go talk to sheep all day. Way better than talking to people all day. This is what I do. He has a nice wife, I'm assuming, because he kept her around. And she had the chance for him to be off when he goes to um, back to Egypt. And she saved his life. So I assume they loved each other. And he had a son at that point. So he's comfortable. Moses is not being held to the fire at all. He's comfortable. And God tells him, Moses, go. I want you to go. I want you to deliver my people. And Moses comes up with excuses. The first thing he says is, he says, who am I? Who am I to go? God, who are you? Who are you that when I go, how do I tell them that it's actually you that sent me? God, they won't believe me. He says, God, they won't. They won't believe me. I'm not a good speaker, God. Amen. I am not a good speaker, God. I shouldn't go. Send somebody else. And then the last excuse is he says, Lord, I don't want to. I don't want to go. I'm comfortable. When I inventory the landscape of my life, everything's as it should be. Everything's good. Now, I want you to move to Exodus from there. This is what Moses' response was. If you move to Exodus 4.27, I want you to see Aaron. Aaron is the brother of Moses. Aaron was left in Egypt. Aaron is a slave. Aaron works every day hard. He's probably beaten. He probably is worried about their next meal. Aaron is being held to the fire, okay? So Exodus 4, 27, it says, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses and look at Aaron's response. So he went and he met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. It turns out, Turns out nobody's actually ready to jump ship until the ship's on fire. Huh? <laughs> the Israelites were looking for deliverance. They had cried out to God for 400 plus years at this point. And when they were told to go, they went without question as far as we know. And then, and then if you move further and Moses finally goes and he goes with Aaron and they meet the Israelite elders, they tell them everything that God has for them in going forward and the Israelite elders' response was the same. They praised and worshiped. Because when we're being held to the fire, that's when we're willing to go. So that scares me for some reason. Because if you're in a situation where you're comfortable and you're not willing to go just because you're comfortable, God will hold you to the fire. He's burning off that shell around you. Okay, so take that as a... As a warning, I guess, or at least I will, because <laughs> I'm, I struggle with fear. <laughs> that it is easy, it is wildly easier to go when the search, the situation around us and that surrounds us is one that we're, is easy, we're eager to escape from. So that's our first 
surrendering our expectations means going despite what we see. And then the second one for today is that surrendering our expectations means that we go in spite of what you don't see. If you'll turn Exodus 16, 2 through 3. I just want to note, like, Jack was so good. He had me, like, tab my little Bible, and he's so awesome. He's the same. I wasn't lying. Um, Exodus 16, 2 through 3. I've always wanted to do this. Trey, say yeehaw when you're there. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Josh hasn't gotten to do that for a couple weeks, and so I'm super pumped about that. Wow. Okay. All right. The spirit left. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So Exodus 16, 2 through 3. Says, so this point, they're past the Red Sea. They're moving forward. Israelites been delivered in awesome ways. 16, 2 through 3, it says, And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, With that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So surrendering expectations means going in spite of what you don't see. The Israelites had been promised a land full, overflowing with milk and honey. The Israelites thought that they would get the other side of freedom, the other side of the Red Sea, and they would be living large on that side of Egypt. They expected full meat pots. They expected to be carb loading every day. They expected honey. They expected awesome. They had cried out for deliverance for 400 plus years and God had made good on it. Don't think for a second they didn't envision what that looked like. And we do the same thing. We do the exact same thing. We say, God, I, I need deliverance in this situation, in my work situation, in my financial situation, in my marriage, in this relationship. I need deliverance. And then in our mind, deliverance comes in a very, very specific sort of way. God, I need deliverance in my job. My job isn't healthy. But then this job opens. It's kind of like um, that ship. Have you guys ever heard that ship joke of the guy who's like, God, deliver me. And ships come by over and over. And he's like, no, God's going to deliver me. And then he dies and gets to heaven. He's like, God, why didn't you deliver me? And it's, he's like, I sent you three ships. What did you want? Right? And it's because our expectations aren't being met. We have this idea of what the promise to us when we move forward and we're faithful and obedient, we have an idea of what the promise is supposed to look like. And if the promise doesn't look like we expected it to, we stall. We back out. We're like, nah, that's not for me. That's not what I actually meant. That's when God holds you to the fire. And that burns. From experience, y'all. I'm not condemning. Um... So reality, so they come out, they move into the wilderness. They're expecting the land overflowing with milk and honey. They're expecting full meat pots. They're expecting to be carb loading. And reality can look really barren and dry when we have an idea of what we thought it would look like on the other side of God telling us to go. It feels really empty of those expectations and like we didn't go the right direction. So I have some examples. It says, I expected that job. I expected that relationship. And I expected that conversation. I expected those things to look like this. But they don't. And when it doesn't, we back out. See, what happens is we have this self-serving nature. It's our flesh. So don't, don't feel condemned. I'm, I'm speaking to myself. We have this self-serving nature that creates this tunnel vision around our face. Um, and tunnel vision of the promise beyond what you could call like a healthy spiritual focus. And then the promise becomes our idol. All we want to do is long and pine after this promise. So turn to Exodus seven sixteen, And I want you guys to see something with that one. What am I doing? What time is this over? 12? Okay. Okay. I just, I'm like, oh, no. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. So turn to Exodus 7, verse 16. This gets missed a lot. Y'all, this is, this is really my favorite story. I think that's why I can't get over it. Either that or I have some weird 
spectrum thing that I just can't get past it. I'm stuck. Um, so 716. So when you recall the VBS tell of what Moses said to Pharaoh, a lot of times people will say, oh yeah, and then Moses went to Pharaoh and he said, let my people go. And he did. But I would argue that they missed the most important part of what God told us to do. He said, let my people, in one simple command, believe it or not, he answers every question as to what he means when he tells us to go. So in verse 16, it says, and you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. I think other versions say worship me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Let my people go. Why? That they may serve me. And where? In the wilderness. Surrendering our expectations doesn't mean that we give them up in defeat. Because that's what it kind of sounds like. I know. It doesn't mean we just give up and say, well, that's not what God wanted for me. Surrendering expectations doesn't mean that we give up in defeat. Surrendering our expectations means that we give them up to the one who defeated and has victory. Right. Okay? Surrendering our expectations means that we go not because the promise is that good, not because it'll be easier than the place we're in right now, but we go because God is with you and with us, and he wants us with him. See, God set us free last year. He set us free, and it was never for freedom's sake alone that we were set free. Jesus died on the cross, not just so that we could be on this side of resurrection and live a willy-nilly, unicorn and rainbow, fun life that's full of ease. Eleven times Moses echoes to Pharaoh God's charge. He says, let my people go so that they may serve me in the wilderness. The purpose was relationship with God. Our purpose in going is relationship with God. But we can come, become so infatuated with what our expectation of the promise looks like that we confuse it for being the purpose. So I've got this part bold in, and I want you to listen really closely. I'll probably repeat it. When the promise becomes our purpose, we abandon the presence of the one who sent us. Say it one more time. When the promise that God has for you, when he says go, when that promise becomes your purpose, we are more than willing to abandon the presence of the one who sent us. And the saddest part about our misfocus is that the promise won't ever sustain you in the desert. It won't sustain you much longer than a couple of days. Only the presence of the one who promised us will sustain us. Amen. I have to wonder how many promises feel broken or questioned because they don't meet our expectations. They don't look like we thought they would look. They don't feel like they thought we thought they should feel. I can tell you on the other side of the New Testament, the Jewish people expected a Messiah to come and conquer the Roman Empire. In this side of the Messiah, they're still waiting. Our expectations could be causing us to miss it too. We got one more thing. Ooh, I'm getting sweaty. That's how I know the spirit moves. Okay. <laughs> it's true. All the Sunday schoolers know. I get sweaty. I'm like, oh, Jesus is here. Okay. <laughs> okay. One more thing, and then I'll let you guys go so you can cheer on Taylor Swift at the football match. <laughs> um, and I'm just kind of winging it at this point. So uh, if you guys... Turn to 5, Exodus 5, 17. I know I'm all over the place. Um, 5, 17, and I'll just kind of share our story where I was at. So March of 2020, I had spent a year, year in self-study of Exodus. Y'all, I'm not exaggerating. I've been in Exodus for a long time. One day, maybe the Lord will let me go to the other parts of the Bible. I'm sure they're great. Um, <laughs> So Josh is regretting this. Okay, fired. Got it. Um, so March of 2020, um, the world was on brink of pandemic, and I've been in Exodus for a year on my own. And and we were coming, I, my own self-study, I was coming into the plagues. I finally made it into the plagues. 
And it was just, it was just God's timing. That's just how it works. It was just God's timing that the entire world was on the brink of pandemic and plague. And I kept finding myself asking over and over again, God, what is this for your people? What is this for your people? God, why? Why did they stay? Why did they stay and watch you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Egyptians and strip them of worshiping idols? What was that? Why not just take them? Why not just take them to the desert? Why not just take them to the promised land? Why not just move them out and you tend to the Egyptians like you do in your own time and not make this incredibly long book that I've been reading for forever? Why, God? And he had the most peculiar, peculiar, I shouldn't have even said that word. He had the most like strange answer for me out of the strangest mouth you could imagine. Because like I told you earlier, each plague is a confrontation of a false god. Each one was because they were worshiping idols. And he wanted to show them that not only is your god weak, but he's false. He is a false idol. So for the Egyptians, Exodus and the freedom and the go charge was about stripping them of worshiping idols. But then when I was asking, it was Pharaoh who spoke to me in 517. He said, you are idle. You are idle. That is why I say to you, or that is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. So y'all, worshiping idols, let me just read this because it was good. Sometimes we are subjected to plagues and trials because of false gods and worshiping idols. Absolutely true. But friends, as believers in Christ, other times we are set free from bondage and led to the desert because of being idle in our worship. We were never meant to just go to the promised land when God char charged us to go. And like he's telling you now, when he says go, He's not saying go and just be happy. He's saying, I'm go, I need you to go. I need you to go into the wilderness because idol worship, I-D-L-E worship. The point for us, for God's people, is to move us from being idle in our worship, from being stalled in our worship. So as we move forward, I felt God saying, go, move from idol worship from your stalled worship, serve God within the desert, expect the desert, take the scenic route to the promise because the chances are that if you aren't willing to serve him in the desert and in the wilderness, you are never willing to serve him in the promise either. So I have a couple challenges for us this week and then uh, I'll, I'll pray us out and hand it over. My first challenge this week is what would your week look like if you surrendered all of your expectations and lived each moment only expecting God's goodness, faithfulness, and above all, his presence, what would that look like? What would your week be like if every breath that God granted you was an act of living worship? Because you remember that when God said go to you, he meant for you to serve in the wilderness while taking the long way around to the promised land. What if surrendering, or what if by surrendering our expectations, we unveil the potential for God's faithfulness to show up in a way that we could only recognize once we've removed the promise focus blinders? And above all, what would the kingdom look like if we were a people of goers who understood the direction when God said, go make disciples, first meant for us to go be disciples? God, I'm so thankful, so thankful. A, that I didn't pass out up here. May have blacked out because I don't really know what I said. But God, I just pray that as we move forward into this week, that you would let our lives be an act of worship. You'd let each breath not be one that we take, take for granted and that it's seeing your praise in all we do. Lord, help us to be consumed with you, with your presence. And let that, to be, let that be our driving force. And 
Lord, let the promise, let the good things, let the favor, let that all just be collateral benefit to walking hand in hand with you because we know we're, that you're good. Whatever expectations we have, Lord, in whatever season we're in, Lord, I pray that we just leave this place stripped or at least cracked open so that we're able to start being stripped of our expectations and only expect you and your goodness and your faithfulness and your presence, not because we're worthy, but because your son who was bore my, bore my sin. I thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, well, if everybody go ahead and stand up. Um, I like that. You know, the, the two points, go despite what you see and then go in spite of what you don't see. And I think that every one of us finds ourselves in one of those two places or both of those for sure. And then she said something at the very end. It said, serve in the wilderness, taking the long way around to the promised land. So serve when you're in the wilderness. And um, man, that's, a, that's just a powerful statement for everybody. I think that if I was to take a poll and here, most people would say, yeah, uh, do you identify with the wilderness or the promised land right now? Most people say uh, wilderness. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, so what an opportunity that we have to serve the Lord when, when we're in the wilderness too. Amen. So I think it's interesting. The first verse that she actually read in Exodus 13, um, it doesn't say that Moses kind of led them the long way around. It says that God led them that way to the wilderness. And so, um, just know that you can be in the wilderness and God, God can place you there. It's not, it doesn't have to be that something's messed up and you took it on turn. God will lead you through the wilderness um, as well. So um, Ashley, that's a, a great message. And I'm thankful uh, for you uh, preaching that today. And um, so, well, uh, let's do the, uh, the blessing, if you will. Anybody who wants to pray when we're done with this, we'll be up here uh, at the front, uh, ready and willing to pray. So um, if, if, if the Holy Spirit's working on you this morning, you just go, man, I just need someone to pray with me or pray through some stuff with me. Uh, that's what we're here for. Um, so let's read the blessing and then we'll be dismissed. It says in Numbers chapter six, verse 22, then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons to bless the people of Israel with a special blessing. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Whenever Aaron and his sons bless the people of Israel in my name, I myself will bless them. So Heavenly Father, thank you for today. I thank you for that word. Father, I pray that you'll just encourage us, the, uh, the people who are in the wilderness, help us to uh, to be faithful, help us to serve when we're there. Father, help the people who who are working, they've found freedom. And, and Father, I pray that we would be the people that would help the people who are in the wilderness and continue to help them to move into the promised land. Father, I pray that everybody in here know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior before they leave here today. They know that he loves them, that he cared for them so much that he was willing to go to the cross and die for them. And uh, Father, I thank you for this message that Ashley brought, and I pray that you'll bless her for that. Lord, it's in your name I pray. Amen. All right. Hey, y'all, make sure next Saturday morning at 8 a.m. You promised me already. 8 a.m. next Saturday morning. Just meet up here. We'll get to work blowing some walls up.